Let's talk about lymphedema. Lymphedema is a little known and little understood disease, but it is really important. Dr. John Chuback, board certified cardiovascular and general surgeon specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders here in Northern New Jersey. Lymphedema is a subject I would love to discuss with you today. It's near and dear to my heart. We have another podcast dedicated to this called the Lymphcast podcast. But let's talk today about the various types of lymphedema. Generally speaking, there are two kinds. There's primary lymphedema and secondary lymphedema. Let's start with primary lymphedema. Primary lymphedema is a swelling of any area of the body where there are lymphatic vessels that are caused by a primary absence or decrease in the normal amount of lymphatic vessels or their function. So what does that mean? Primary lymphedema typically is something that happens at birth or has happened in the embryological process of development of the fetus while in the uterus, what we call in utero. So you could actually see an infant born with a swollen limb, could be an upper limb, lower limb, more than one limb. And this would be as a result of what we call agenesis or hypoplasia of the lymphatic vessels. The other thing that's really interesting about the lymphatic system is that the lymphatic system is part of two other systems. It's part of both the circulatory system and it's in circulation, and we'll talk a bit about that. And it's also part of the immunological or immune system. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. In future videos, we'll talk a lot more about all of these things. Primary lymphedema is again, either an absence of lymphatic vessels or a hypoplasia, meaning an underdevelopment of lymphatic vessels or a poor function of the lymphatic system and lymphatic vessels. So in some individuals, they may not see this early in life. It may, it may take time to see that they have a primary lymphedema. And this again is represented by swelling in one or more, typically of the limbs, but it can be in other areas. It could be in the head and neck area. It could be in the abdominal area, pelvic area, genitalia. It could be in many areas and it can be isolated or it can be multiple and it can also be generalized. Now let's talk about secondary lymphedema. What is secondary lymphedema? Secondary lymphedema generally means that the lymphatic system was normal to begin with and something happened to injure the lymphatic system or to decrease its function. A very common scenario would be surgical trauma to the lymphatic system. So for example, a classic situation especially in days past, but we're still seeing it today, make no mistake about it, would be lymphedema of the upper extremity, typically in a woman who's had breast surgery for cancer and sampling of the lymph nodes. Remember that could happen in a man too. And that's another subject for another day, male breast cancer, very important and very interesting subject. But lymphedema of the upper extremity can occur after a breast cancer, after sampling lymph nodes in the axillary region, the underarm area. Why? When a breast cancer grows in the breast, one of the first places it can spread is through the lymphatic vessels to the lymph nodes under the arm. And the reason for that is because the lymphatic system is part of the circulation and the immune system. So the lymphatic system is always looking for foreign cells in the body, whether those are bacteria, fungi, viruses, chemicals, or malignant cells like you find in cancer. So the breast surgical oncologist will oftentimes sample or biopsy those lymph nodes in the underarm area to see if there's any cancer there. That's very important for staging. And staging, meaning what stage of cancer is this? Is it is stage one, two, three, four, et cetera. Staging is very important for making a proper diagnosis and treatment plan. Because as cancers progress to higher stages, typically the treatment becomes more involved and might include things like chemotherapy, and radiation therapy in addition to surgery. Let's talk about radiation because radiation is another common cause of lymph node and lymphatic vessel destruction, typically, again, 
for treatment of a cancer. So let's say, for example, a patient had a melanoma of the lower extremity, a malignant skin cancer of the lower extremity, which was found to have traveled to the groin lymph nodes. These groin lymph nodes are commonly biopsied and can be involved in capturing cancer cells, trapping them there and keeping them from getting further into the circulation and being spread throughout the body. So one treatment option might be for certain patients, radiation therapy of those lymph nodes in the groin if, if they're known to contain cancer. The radiation itself can injure the lymph nodes and the lymphatic vessels. And this could lead to lymphatic dis destruction, lymphatic dysfunction, and a swollen lower extremity, for example. So those are a couple of examples of secondary lymphedema, where the lymph system was normal to begin with, and now as a result of either surgical trauma, radiation injury, those lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes could be injured, leading to swelling of an extremity. Traumatic injuries are another potential cause of lymphatic vessel uh, damage and lymph node vessel damage. Infection is another potential cause of lymphatic vessel injury and lymph node injury. In mostly in underdeveloped countries and not frequently, very rarely here in the United States, you could have certain parasitic infections, worms and things that can get into the circulation and clog the uh, lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes causing, in some cases, massive swelling of a lower extremity or an upper extremity and beyond. So why is lymphedema so important? Well, I think it's very important because it has not only physical manifestations of a swollen limb, but as we've seen in the LymphCast podcast many times, it also can have intense psychosocial and emotional contributions that can have a massive a negative impact on a patient's quality of life. This has a significant impact on how a patient feels about themselves, their physical um, appearance. It can have an impact on intimate relationships, personal relationships, and things like that, clothing that people can wear, how they might feel wearing a short sleeve shirt or a pair of pants or a pair of shorts or a bathing suit, and even a pair of pants, quite frankly. Some patients have lymphedema, which is so pronounced, unfortunately, that even in a pair of long pants, an observer could see that that limb is badly swollen. So. Other manifestations of the lymphedema is that it can cause other complications. For example, it can cause infection, what we call cellulitis, red discoloration of the skin, dermatitis, cellulitis, which can be painful and very uncomfortable. And that process can be chronic and ongoing. So lymphedema, unfortunately, is still not well understood by many members of the medical community, including doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, and other healthcare providers. So we are doing our very best to raise awareness about lymphedema so that those patients can be properly diagnosed and then treated and managed. Let's talk a little bit about treatment and management of lymphedema. Well, depending on the primary cause, whether this is a primary lymphedema or a secondary lymphedema, and what that particular clinical situation is, treatment can be tailored to the management of that lymphatic system and the swollen limb. Some of the things that are done are what we call conservative or non-interventional. Others are more aggressive, more invasive, and interventional. And the fact that they're more aggressive or interventional does not mean that um, they're by any means a uh, poor option. It just means they might require some sort of interventional procedure to do. But in many cases, patients will have extraordinary relief and results from those kinds of procedures. The most common non-interventional or conservative treatment is some form of compression therapy. Compression therapy can take numerous forms. Sometimes it's with what we call a graduated compression stocking, an elastic stocking of some kind, which has graduated compression. What does graduated compression mean? Graduated compression means that the pressure along the 
length of the garment changes. So for example, a common compression garment might be what we call a 20 to 30 millimeter mercury compression garment, meaning that at the, let's say it were a, a stocking for the lower leg, going all the way from the foot to the high thigh, which is a common garment. Another common garment would be a knee high stocking from the foot to the, uh, to the knee, just below the knee. In either case, you would have 30 millimeters of mercury pressure at the foot and ankle area, and then higher up along the uh, calf and the mid leg area, it might be 25. And then at the knee area for a knee length stocking, it would be 20. So 30, 25, 20, getting progressively lower as you go up the limb and closer to the heart. And this promotes lymphatic flow and venous flow out of the extremity to get uh, swelling and excess fluid out of the soft tissue and back into the circulation. Hopefully that fluid getting back into the circulation will find its way to the kidney where it can be filtered and processed as excess fluid and be turned into urine and then be expelled from the body. So those stockings can truly move fluid into the circulation and out of the body under the best circumstances. So that's a graduated compression stocking. There are also a number of devices which can be mechanical devices. For example, a lymphatic pump, which can be a series of air bladders that squeeze the lower extremity in a systematic way, in a sequential way, so that they milk fluid, milk excess lymphatic fluid out of the lower extremity or upper extremity back into the circulation and then hopefully processed to be moved out of the body um, through urination. Additionally, there are some newer garments which are mechanical but not working by air bladders, not working on a pneumatic system. They're working on a variety of different high-tech uh, processes that actually constrict and contract to move fluid out of the body well, not using air bladders. And some of those newer devices we'll discuss on uh, shows in the future, those can be very, very convenient because many of them can now be worn in a ambulatory way, meaning that the patient can wear it and go to work and go to the park and do various uh, things, go shopping, go to the supermarket, et cetera, so that they don't have to just be lying down while they're getting their, their therapy. So these are forms of conservative therapy. More invasive treatments, which are fascinating and very, very interesting to talk about, could be surgical options. One would be what's called a lymphovenous anastomosis. One is called a lymphatic transplant or transfer, taking lymph nodes from one area of the body and transplanting them in the same patient to another area where they might help to increase flow in that area. And then another operation could be liposuction for lymphedema, which again is a very highly specialized kind of liposuction, which should only be done in the hands of experts with tremendous um, experience in that area. And we have had on the LymphCast some of those physicians on our show, and it's a very fascinating area of uh, not only research, but current practice in, in the right hands. So. These are some of the surgical interventional options for the management of various kinds of lymphedema. And then of course, there are other conservative treatments like for example, dietary supplementation, micronized purified flavonoid fraction, which has an antioxidant effect and has been shown to support both the venous and lymphatic system, as well as other dietary supplements, which we can talk about more in the future. Ruscus, which is butcher's broom and rutin and many other natural products that are considered dietary supplements here in the United States, like grapeseed extract, horse chestnut, etc. Activity, motion, exercise also tends to be very good for the lymphatic system because as the large muscles of the uh, lower extremity constrict and contract, that helps to move both blood out of the leg and lymphatic flow out of the leg. We want that lymphatic system contracting and functioning to the best of its ability. So I think today we touched on a broad overview of 
lymphedema and the lymphatic system. I will do more videos talking more about how the lymphatic system works specifically uh, and what its relationship is to the circulation and to the arteries and veins and soft tissues of the body. So I hope you'll tune in for more episodes with Dr. John Chuback for your health and wellness. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.